Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Willeke Wendrich. I'm the director of the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, of which the press is maybe one of our most important uh, and, and vibrant activities. Um, I want to start with acknowledging our editorial board, because all of the publications that we create, or that our authors create, are peer-reviewed and discussed by a panel of uh, lustrous colleagues, and I want to recognize them here tonight. Uh, of course, first of all, Randy Dunford, our director of publications. Um, <laughs> she will do tonight's introduction of our speakers. Uh, then our editor-in-chief is Aaron Burke, who is not here at the moment because he's hanging out in Vienna on a research sabbatical. Uh, John Papadopoulos is here. You can clip for him as well. <laughs> Professor Lee Min, who is on sabbatical at the moment. Professor Greg Schechner, who I haven't seen. Professor Richard Lejour. Um, Professor Ellen Perlstein. And then we have two new members. Uh, Greg Wolf, who is uh, in the UCLA history department, and he's a Roman historian, archaeologist, and Jerry Moore, who is from um, Cal State Dominguez Hills. Uh, he is an Andeanist, uh, and he recently also joined our board. I also would like to recognize a number of people who are here with us. Uh, Directors Council members, uh, David Butchever, there. Hi, David. <laughs> and a new member who I heard brought his brother, Jim Harris. Welcome, both of you. And uh, we, we want to keep in memory uh, your mother, who was a very, very highly esteemed uh, volunteer in the Coatsen Institute, a very knowledgeable person who created a wonderful uh, database still in paper at that time of seals from Mesopotamia and uh, we are going to make that into a beautiful digital record that will be available for everybody to use. So I really want to commemorate your mother here as well. Thank you. Um, then Bruce Hector is here as well and of course Ernestine Elster, welcome. <laughs> And I may have forgotten people, but you're all welcome. Uh, so let me briefly introduce Randy Danford. Uh, she has a BA in archaeology, anthropology, no, classics and archaeology. And um, I knew Randy a long time ago uh, in Cairo, where we were both living. And she then started work for uh, the University of Cairo Press and at some point she applied with us and I can tell you it's the best decision I've ever made as director. Um, Randy completely turned around the press which was after Ernestine who used to be the head of the press years and years and years ago had sort of declined a little bit, I can say, and Randy really put this back in the limelight with amazing publications, um, guided through the whole system in the most professional way. So Randy, I'm internally grateful, and now I give you the floor to introduce our speakers. Thank you very much, Vilka. That is um, a really nice introduction. And welcome, everybody. I see friends and colleagues. And welcome to our third Spotlight event, which is um, designed to promote the books and authors of the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology Press. We're very honored to have Bill Parkinson and Attila Gaiuche here tonight. Attila is a professor at the University of Georgia in anthropology, and Bill Parkinson is a curator at the Field Museum in Chicago and a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago. 
Um, working on this book has been so much fun, I have to say, although I was sometimes um, the victim of what I can only describe as extreme comma harassment by one of the authors who shall remain nameless, Attila. <laughs> and uh, we, as a team, with our designer, Doug Brotherton, who is also here tonight, Doug, Uh, and our copy editor who is in Egypt, um, and all of the people who helped put this book together, not to mention the 11 nations of, of the eastern part of Europe who cooperated. Um, and Attila and Bill will tell you more details about what a joy that was. So I have to say it's an extremely important international cooperation and the museum exhibition is now on in New York at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. It is going to the Field Museum in March of 2023. At the end there will be some time for questions so we'll also be w welcoming our Zoom participants who please put questions in the chat and we'll field those. And after that please join us in the courtyard for a reception books will be available for a special discount for this event. So with that, I welcome the authors of the first kings of, e of Egypt, I was going to say, <laughs> Europe. We'll do that one next. <laughs> uh -huh. Hi, everybody. Uh, can you hear me? We good? Sounds OK? Um, hi, welcome. Um, so it's a real pleasure to, to be here to celebrate uh, this book and, and this, this project. Uh, I was last in LA over 20 years ago when I interviewed for a job at UCLA. Um, and I remember John and Sarah showing me around and I met many of you. It's wonderful to see old faces in this room and many new faces too. Um, I, I'm just gonna, so Attila and I were talking about, it's really weird when you have two people talking and one person talks and then the other person talks. And um, so we talked about different ways of doing this and what we decided is that that's what we would do, is that one of us would talk and then the other person would talk and then the other person would talk because we couldn't figure out another way to do it. So I'm sorry, I apologize in advance. Um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do right now is I'm gonna give just sort of a, a very general introduction and. Some, some general acknowledgments. Um, and Attila and I thought that, you know, when we think about this project, this isn't a project that started seven years ago. Um, this is actually a project that started over 20 years ago when Attila and I started collaborative work in Eastern Europe. Um, and we thought it would be interesting for you to sort of see the long-term evolution of that from the beginnings of our collaboration um, through you know, some specifics about how this actual project happened and then talk quite a bit about the actual project itself and then um, the, the books. Um, so I'm gonna start just with um, you know, this basic introduction. These are the two amazing books that we're here to celebrate today. Um, there's a long story about why there are two books, and I want to thank everybody on the editorial board for working with us. Part of that is a COVID story that we'll get to later in the, in the project. Um, but the first one is out. You can buy it. Uh, the second one will be out very soon, uh, and uh, they will be available uh, as individual books or, or sold together. Uh, I'm going to leave a little bit of this for, for Attila to get into. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the project. Um, this is really a, an unprecedented project. I, I honestly believe nobody's done anything like this in North America, certainly not from this part of the world. Um, this was a, a very ambitious project that involves 11 countries from sort of the greater Balkan world in southeastern Europe, uh, and 26 different lending institutions uh, that uh, trusted us to bring materials to North America for a, a, a three venue tour here um, to really give us the, the, the privilege of being able to tell their story and to talk about uh, the, the amazing archaeology of this part of the world and the absolute amazing cultural past of this part of the world. Um, 
in a way, we felt that uh, we were almost obliged to do this. Me with a position at the Field Museum, our long-term collaboration together. Um, and, you know, it's an interesting time in museums in Europe. In general, in museums in Europe, they don't tell big stories. You know, the story of this show is really how do small farming villages turn into some of the earliest tribal kingdoms in Europe. In Europe, they're not telling these kinds of stories. And they're certainly not telling these kinds of stories um, that are, are this broad in scope and that have this much time depth. Um, and so we want to recognize all of the folks at those lending institutions, including many of the people who contributed to the book, um, both books. Uh, on the left, you can see over here the list of contributors that contributed to the essay volume on the right, the folks who actually wrote uh, the, the catalog entries with us. And these, this is just a fraction of the folks who actually made this exhibition happen and these books happen. Um, we, we can't thank them enough for their trust in us. You know, some, some folks told us, like, that's never going to happen. Don't even bother. We're not even going to participate. Um, but we showed them. It actually did. And it's really because of the folks that we worked with over there. Um, as Rondi mentioned, uh, the exhibition is currently open at the Institute for the Study of the Ancient World. It will open at the Field Museum uh, at the end of March. And after one year, then it will tra travel to the Canadian Museum of, of History. Um, and after that, the objects will be very tired and they will all go back, back home. Um, we were fortunate enough to receive funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, your tax dollars, thank you very much, that funded a big chunk of this exhibition for us. We also received money from the America for Bulgaria Foundation. We just got corporate sponsorship at the Field Museum from Discover. Um, so we really have a, a ton of people to thank. And in addition to all of our colleagues at the Field Museum, um, who've astonishingly trusted us to pull this off. Um, we really want to thank you. Um, you know, the Coatsen is, is a really, it's a really important place. Uh, there are very few institutes like it in the world, let alone in North America. It's a very important institution. Uh, and uh, we've really benefited from especially the Coats and Press. Um, you know, this is, I'm proud to say, this is my, that co catalog's gonna be the fifth book that I've done with Coats and. Uh, and there really aren't other venues out there that are doing this. It's a very important contribution to archeology. span And, you know, really everybody in the room deserves a round of applause because it's, it's, a, it's a very important, it's a very important institution, and uh, I think we're very fortunate to have it around. Um, I can't thank Rondi and the rest of the, the folks who've just helped us, Doug, who's been so patient dealing with Attila's commas. Uh, and uh, our, you know, Attila and I have worked together for 20 years, over 20 years, and so we fight like an old married couple. And, you know, Doug and Rondi got exposed to that. I also want to thank Neil for copy editing the book and Garrett for, for all of his help. So uh, you have a wonderful staff, and we're very, very fortunate and, and, you know, to have had the privilege to have worked with them. I also want to thank our spouses, Betsy and Danny, who are back there, for letting us have these crazy careers to be able to pull these things off. Um, this, is, this exhibition and this project has been a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for me um, and for Attila. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Attila. Okay, I don't like it. Uh, all right, so I'm the coma guy, okay? Uh, thank you very much, guys, for... Yeah, a little bit further. Okay. Uh, thank you. What? Good. Thanks a lot uh, for being with us today. And again, guys, thanks a lot for your help and your your being being tolerant, very tolerant with me uh, during this process of of editing the books. 
uh, I try to be a little bit better in the future, but I'm, unfortunately, I'm a little bit OCD. I cannot really do anything with that. So, all right. So, what I would like to talk about is actually our research with Bill. So, this whole project that we are talking about, the First Kings of Europe project, is an actual regular collaboration of about more than 200 people. It really started at a much smaller scale. So it started at this building in Hungary, South Eastern Hungary, we are in 1998. I was working there as an archaeologist, as a curator, as a prehistorian, and I got this phone call while I was in the field that, well, there's this weird American dude who wants to talk to you. I'm like, God, oh, dude, I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's like, it's a really exhausting day, but fine. Okay, let's just meet. So we met at the museum, and, well, actually, it went pretty well, and uh, we continued after the museum closed. We continued at a, another place, which is not exactly a museum, and then, you know, we continued our, our conversation the same evening, then we went into the night, and actually we learned that it seems that actually we get along pretty well. So if we get along pretty well, and we have pretty much the same interest, why don't we work together? And we basically put together a five-year plan. Five-year plan was very important in my life. You know, I grew up in Krakomi, Hungary, and we had all these five-year plans, so I need that five-year plan back in my life. So, okay, so we have this five-year plan, but we need also to find a good project name. And we figured out that <laughs> this is going to be a good project name. Well, uh, this is one of those moments when, you know, when you're in your 20s, you think that you're very funny and very creative. Then when you're in your 50s, like now, then you got to just stick with it. Uh, and okay, we still love it, all right? So, so this is the Kurdish Regional Archaeological Project. So first, you know, let's just see where we are working at. So this is where we are, uh, Hungary, southeastern Hungary. We have this so-called Kurdish Basin right here. So, uh, this is Hungary, close to Italy, and you know, then in the southeast of Hungary, right here, and this is the Kurdish area. So, this region is like pretty much Kansas uh, with less cattle. Okay, so it doesn't seem to be geographically very interesting. However, this is actually a gold mine. This region is a gold mine. So what I'm showing you right here, we are again in southeast Hungary. This is the Kurdish region. And you can see this really weird polygon right here. So this really weird polygon represents many parishes in northern, uh, uh, northern Bekish County. And these parishes were subject to systematic archaeological work, archaeological topographical work, work which means that over 30 years, our awesome colleagues collected uh, information about the location of the site, the extent of the site, their chronologies. They mapped all these sites using surface surveys. And they not just collected these data, but also published these data for about 4,000 square kilometers, which is like roughly 15 square miles. It's a fantastic data set to work with. That was the reason why this guy actually showed up on that particular day, because he knew about this data. It's like a fantastic data set. So uh, we started working together in this region. And uh, if I need to really, in a tiny nutshell, summarize what we have done in the past 25 years, starting in 1998, well, we focus on major transformations, social, economic, and cultural transformations in the fifth uh, millennium BC. So we'd like to explore all the social, social, cultural, and economic changes that occurred on the Great Hungarian Plain during this period, focusing on this Kurdish region as our study area. So first, what we focused on uh, is actually the occurrence of large uh, late Neolithic settlements, the emergence of these large late Neolithic settlements. And you would see that uh, pre previously, in the, during the middle Neolithic, there were all these like dispersed small settlements, and during about like 5,000, uh, and between 5,000 and 4,500 BC, they 
aggregated population inoculation occurred and they established large sites and you would see that these large, large sites were actual centers of smaller and larger polities. So that was, uh, that characterized this early uh, 5,000 from 5,000 to 4,500 BC era. And of course, we wanted to know more about how these sites, these large centers formed, how they developed over time. And uh, we focused on some uh, specific large nucleated sites during this, this uh, late Neolithic period, including sac column site with actually a tail site, these uh, darker areas which represent old river meanders, and the yellow uh, uh, signs would represent actual houses. So what we are talking about here is a huge large settlement, roughly 90 hectares, that organized around a tail site. These were the first large almost urban settlements that occurred uh, in southeastern Europe. Well, you know, uh, what happened though, that these settlements at some point around like 4,500 BC throughout the Great Hungarian Plain got abandoned. And we would see a very different settlement organization as you can see here with small settlements and these small settlements, for example, these two that we also excavated extensively in the early 2000s, would show that these settlements were fortified. Also, you would find uh, several houses on them, but they were very small compared to late Neolithic sites. And you know, this is a kind of like reconstruction. What happened? This is a early copper age site, and you know what happened uh, during uh, over time that around like 4,500 BC, these large sites, like the sac column site here, uh, basically got abandoned, and the smaller units, neighborhood units, established their own settlements in the landscape. So that's, you know, our research in a nutshell, really in a nutshell. So uh, these results uh, par partially were uh, published uh, not too long ago with uh, the Kotzen Institute, this is a Bickery to Copper Age Villages book, uh, what we are really proud of. Uh, the other, another aspect that we need to mention, that during this period we trained a lot of students. We train a lot of students, uh, altogether more than 150 students were trained, and many of them came back to the region to work, not just with us, but to establish their own projects. So these are the five major projects that currently are ongoing uh, in, area, uh, in our area, in the so-called Kurash region. Uh, and you know, we help each other, we work together. Uh, this is a real collaboration, a real cooperation. And uh, as a result of that, we could, for example, start projects that no one had uh, had any chance to do. So for example, we have this large late Neolithic tell site here, and uh, we know these, these, this community at Vesta. You know, these guys, uh, have been struggling with a major issue. So we have this big uh, trench in the tell site, which is a settlement mound, starting from the Neolithic to the Bronze Age. We have altogether roughly seven meters of stratigraphy here. So they excavated this trench, 90 meter long. They covered the trench, sheltered the trench, but over time, problems occurred. Uh, this is what you can see here, basically, uh, the trench is deteriorating, so we established together with all these projects working in the region uh, a specific uh, project in order to somehow save this very important site. This site is part of a national park and it's crazy important for the local community. It's a very important identity anchor and of course, you know, it's also a very important economic uh, economically very important. So this is, you know, what we were doing in the past uh, uh, roughly 10, 25 years in a nutshell. 
But the, the whole point of this is collaboration, what I would like to really refer to, that we collaborate with the local community, we collaborate with each other, and we collaborate all these other projects in the region in order to uh, make this region recognizable archaeology, archaeologically. And it was very important actually to do so, because we collect this kind of like social capital in the region. Uh, we've been working there for 25 years. Many archaeologists would just go to the next place, would jump to, to another place in three, four years. We've been there, there for 25 years in the region. Uh, we participated, have participated in conferences, in other projects. We became kind of like known entities in order to establish something bigger or something different, and that was exactly this exhibition and the book projects. All right, give me the clicker. Give me the click, come on. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so um, I just want to take some time to talk a little bit about the sort of the actual history of the, of the project itself. Um, we can talk about the name later. Everybody wants to talk about the name. We can get there during Q&A, I promise. Um, but there were, you know, there were a bunch of things that all came together to make this project work um, in terms of timing and in terms of, uh, you know, just sort of the curveballs that, that life throws you. Uh, I, w I was hired at the Field Museum in 2008, and I, the very first exhibition I was asked to work on was on Atlantis. And when I said, but that's not a thing. Like, they said, figure it out. Fortunately, the world economy collapsed in 2008 and that exhibition didn't happen, which saved me a lot of work. Then, then I worked on a bunch of different exhibitions. Uh, Chinggis Khan, uh, Last Co, uh, a whole slew of things I didn't know anything about. Uh, and then finally, this exhibition on ancient Greece came up. And uh, this was a, a exhibition that was organized originally by National Geographic and the Greek Ministry of Culture that pulled um, objects from almost 20 different Greek museums from northern Greece all the way down to Crete. And uh, I had the privilege of being a curator on this exhibition when it came to North America. Uh, and I learned a lot from that exhibition. In a way, the exhibition that we've done here Rips, a lot, uh, rips off a lot from what happened in that exhibition. It basically covers the same time period from the Neolithic uh, up through and including the, the Iron Age. And it gave me the idea that we could do these big, these big exhibitions. Um, another thing that happened was uh, we did an exhibition in 2017 at the Field Museum where we have a pretty amazing Etruscan, Greek, Egyptian, uh, what am I missing? Etruscan, Greek, Egyptian, Roman collections that have never been on display where the museum is now. And so I was looking at all these different collections, many of which were bought or, or donated. We don't have good pro provenience on many of them. We don't, we, we, they weren't excavated on projects. It's difficult to say something about them, but what we figured out we could do was put them all together to talk about how all these societies were in it, constant interaction with each other uh, from the very beginning. Uh, and in 2017, politically, that was real interesting thing to be talking about, different cultures coming into contact with one another in North America. And uh, what we did in this exhibition was we made very clear links between the past and the present. And the end result was saying, you know, um, this has been going on a while. We've had different people with different religions and different ethnicities in contact with each other for a long time. And actually, humans are pretty damn good at it. We're actually very good at this. And uh, it worked. Like what, what was amazing about this exhibition is that it actually worked. Like people went through it and they got it. They figured it out. We, we put the links together to the extent that I actually got fan mail for an exhibition. That never happens. You usually get hate mail for exhibitions because they don't like the map. It's always about the map. Um, 
And in fan mail, a, a gentleman wrote me and said, I was really impressed with the exhibition. And what I really liked about it was that it reminded me of this quote from this theologian, philosopher, writer, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton. And basically, the gut of this quote is that if we're not paying attention to what happened in the past, we can't really understand where we are today. And that's when I was amazed that somebody had actually paid attention and really saw what we were trying to do in that exhibition. Um, and that's when I went, this is the way we need to be doing all of these exhibitions. If there's nothing relevant, they don't care. They don't care. You have to make things relevant to people in their lives today. The other thing that happened in this time was Attila, after a long career in Hungary, decided to move to the United States. And it was actually during the Greeks exhibition that he came over on a, initially as a postdoc in Chicago. Um, and while all of this was going on, we were saying, you know, we should really do this exhibition on, on Southeastern Europe. Nobody's done it before. Nobody else can really do it. We've been working there for other people. People trust us. We can actually pull this off. And amazing museum is one of the only places in the world that could do an exhibition like this. Um, the other thing that was going on while we were working on the exhibition, which really started in, you know, as an idea in 2015 and 2017, one of the one of the, Oxfam posted this amazing, this just amazing statistic, which is. You know, we just crossed 8 billion people. In 2017, eight individual humans owned half of all of the wealth in the world. Like, wrap your brain around that. Half of all of the wealth owned by 8 billion people was owned by eight individual humans. And while we were putting together this show, we were thinking, wow, that's a really... It's really kind of what we're talking about if we're talking about the emergence of these these kingdoms from their their Neolithic roots in these small Neolithic villages. We're really talking about the beginning of these inequalities that characterize the world today. Um, the problem is, that's a really depressing story and nobody wants to go to see an exhibition about it. But the flip side of that is also the emergence of very strong leaders. And we decided that if we could put together this show and thread the needle where we're talking about inequality, we're talking about, um, we're talking about unequal the world is, and that actually that's something that's very recent in the human experience, but we can also talk about other positive developments in the emergence of leadership that we could pull off this show and actually make it relevant to people today to make them want to come see these absolute treasures from ancient Southeastern Europe. So we started in earnest. Um, we convinced this guy, Jaap Hoogstraten, who's the director of exhibitions, to come with us to uh, Eastern Europe because we wanted to make sure that everybody at the museum knew what an insane project this was gonna be. And we wanted to make sure that they knew and understood how difficult it was going to be. And so we started uh, with trips. We started in Hungary because we had been working there forever. We got some buy-in from Hungary, and then we went to Romania. And we said, well, you know, the Hungarians are really excited about this project. Uh, and then the Romanians were excited about the project. And then we went to Bulgaria, and then we went to Croatia, and we went on several different trips just to talk to people, to meet people, um, is our wonderful colleague Goce Naumov from Skopje um, in, in North Macedonia. Um, and uh, to talk to them. And one of the things that we learned from the Greeks exhibition was when the Greek ministry went to a bunch of different Greek museums and said, you will give that, you will give that, you will give that, the folks who worked in those museums did not like that. It didn't go over well. So in this case, we said, hey, we have this idea. We, ha we have this idea, we have this concept uh, of something we'd like to do. What do you think of that idea? What, 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 do you th what objects do you think might be appropriate in that show? And gradually, slowly, one country after another 
we went around, we bought, um, we got buy-in. We had folks actually working with us. Uh, these are our colleagues, Rudens Ruka and Rovena Kurti uh, in uh, Tirana, showing us around some of their amazing Iron Age objects. Uh, this is Adriana Pravidur in Sarajevo. Uh, and you'll notice the dates, right? This wasn't one trip where we were one and done. Um, these are other colleagues from the Field Museum. Uh, this is in Belgrade, uh, meeting with some very old colleagues that someone had worked with in the mid-90s, uh, reinventing old relationships that we'd had for the last 20, 30 years in the region. And uh, then finally going back, this is Adam Vago, who uh, photographed, took all the photographs in the book. Um, in February 2020, we were going full guns. Things were amazing. Uh, we were going over, this is our mount maker from the Field Museum. We're taking measurements for mounts so we know how to mount everything. It was going incredible. This project was going to happen. Uh, and then COVID happened. And uh, that was a, a big blow. It, it really put everything on hold. With a project as fragile and as complicated as this, we were really concerned that uh, it might never come back. At this point, we had already convinced the folks at Coatsen and the board to publish a book. And we had all of the essays done. The book existed, and it looked like the project wasn't going to happen, that the exhibition wasn't going to happen. So we said, well, let's just publish the book anyway. And amazingly, Coatsen worked with us and said, yeah, let's do it. That's how we ended up with two books. That's why the essay volume is carved off from the catalog. And uh, really, if we didn't have you working with us on that, it, it, it could have been an absolute disaster. The other weird thing that happened was literally March 17th, everybody remembers, was the day the world shut down. The next week, we got a, a, a National Endowment for Humanities grant to support the project for several hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and we had just basically canceled the project. Um, so we gradually, one of, the, one of the stipulations of the NEH grant is that it had to have two US venues. And even though the Canadians were all in, uh, Gatineau is not in the United States, and so we needed another venue in the U.S. And uh, after, I think, several months of us being quite depressed and thinking this wasn't ever going to happen, we finally got the folks at the Institute for the, St for the Study of the Ancient World, as part of NYU, to, to accept the project, which just popped it all open. And uh, we're proud to say it opened there uh, earlier this year. Uh, so it's been it's been a long haul, um, but we're we're very glad that this this project has finally finally come to fruition. Now Till is going to do a quick walkthrough of the exhibition. Yeah, just a really quick one. Uh, of course, well, we are talking about more than seven hundred and fifty artifacts from. Yeah. Okay, so more than 750 artifacts and uh, altogether 114 assemblages in 114 assemblages, a great amount of artifacts. So of course, you know, I cannot talk about each artifact. It's going to be just a really quick walkthrough. So in terms of layout, uh, we, are in the, we are working with the field museum layout with that. So you would see that we have an intro session, then we have a chronological order in the exhibition, Neolithic, Copper Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. That's the field museum setting, and the Canadian okay, Canadian colleagues will apply pretty much the same organization. So we would start with the intro. We will start actually a crown, a copy of a Romanian crown from the, from the beginning of the 20th century, in order to, you know, ask the question that, you know what kings and queens are, but how did we get there? What is the story to the more or less egalitarian societies to kings and queens and dynasties? And then, uh, we are entering into our analytic session. Uh, just a few artifacts again. Uh, we'll show, for example, this figurine. You know, these figurines 
are kind of important in our stories because when we talk about Neolithic, we talk about more or less egalitarian societies. At least this is how we know in southeastern Europe. However, when we take a look at these specific beautiful objects, actually they might have represented not definitely deities, but ancestors. And you know, these ancestors were very important for these people. And actually, when it comes to, to, for example, family histories, they could very likely have actually kind of like measured that who had a cooler ancestor and who didn't have that cool ancestor. And with that, of course, kind of like ranking would have occurred, of course, not formal social ranking, but kind of ranking could have occurred within the societies. Also, uh, there is this seemingly not that interesting collection of artifacts. They are spondylus bracelets and a spondylus ring from a very important Neolithic site in Hungary. Well, you know, on the Great Hungarian Plain, and this is what we are talking about, Hungary, on the Great Hungarian Plain, we don't have spondylus, right? It needs to travel from either the Adriatic or the Aegean. So when we actually uh, so these artifacts, especially in their specific context, it was found in a burial, late Neolithic burial, with other uh, artifacts that actually came from remote regions. So we can talk about how even if we are talking about more or less egalitarian societies in Southeast Europe, well, there were cases when other people had better access to goods than than uh, other, another group of people. We have actually those ones who had either the social or economic power in order to have more than others. Because typically during the Neolithic, you would find very simple burials with one or two vessels or with nothing. This is an extremely rich burial talking about this really incipient form of inequality. Well, you know, just to show other elements of the exhibition, we are going to have these atmospheric murals. Uh, this is a, a, a house from, from the, the Neolithic uh, from, from Hungary. And uh, we are going to have like four of the murals just to give you some sense of, of the atmosphere of uh, the exhibition. Then the next session is about the Copper Age. This is the time when even if during the Neolithic you would find some sporadic copper finds. But you know, this is the period when actual metallurgy started. And this is a kind of like atmospheric uh, uh, image, you know, how this session would look like. And then, you know, I would like to show this collection of one of the, the first, uh, one of the earliest large copper tools from Serbia. And you know, these copper tools, very, very important because, you know, as opposed to the previous period where actually uh, the, 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 the control of material flow was more or less very likely like a small scale, more or less egalitarian, here we would see that some people, some selected individuals would control the, the, the acquaintance of raw materials, also they would control the production, they would control the production, uh, the production sorry, and the distribution of these materials, and we would see a kind of like differentiation, again, a very initial differentiation, uh, social differentiation in these societies. Then, you know, we have this really fantastic, beautiful assemblage from Varna. The Varna Cemetery, dates around like 4,600, 4,400 BC, and there is no predecessor of, their, of the wealth that was accumulated by the people who were buried in this cemetery. We are talking about roughly 300 burials with more than 3,000 gold artifacts, altogether roughly six kilograms of gold artifacts in these, in these specific burials. In addition to copper, in addition to, to exotic materials, this is completely unseen. This is like something from the middle of nowhere. We did not see an actual development that would, would lead to actually such a, such a uh, accumulation of wealth by one specific community, and it did. But then, later on, around like 4,400 BC, the Actually, this community, this larger community, large regional community, somehow dissolved and 
it took another 2,000 years to see such a great amount of wealth accumulated by other people. So it's kind of like a really weird, very unique story in the prehistory of Southeastern Europe. Of course, you know, in order to understand how these different kind of artifacts, uh, especially gold artifacts, copper artifacts, spondylus artifacts, marble artifacts were distributed in the cemetery. We have our first interactive in this session so people could learn about the structure of the cemetery, where specific artifacts were found, the patterns. So it's a, uh, one of those interactives that will occur in the exhibition. And now we are uh, uh, entering into the Bronze Age. Uh, we will use these kind of like transitional sessions in order to, to somehow move people from one period to another uh, uh, to, to give some uh, atmospheric uh, 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 feeling you know, for them. And this is the Bronze Age session. We are entering the Bronze Age session. We would see actually a horse rider here. Uh, we are referring to the importance of horse and horse riders in this period here. This is the first period when actual horses were introduced and used actively at warfare and in other for, for other purposes. And this is the period where we would see the first bronze artifacts. With bronze, the world has changed. We all change dramatically because during the copper age, you know, we are dealing with uh, these larger and smaller tools, but they were really soft. When with, with, well, with the bronze, you would have these much harder materials, much better for using as weapons. And with that, we would see the emergence of warrior Erictors, aristocracy, a warrior elite, a warrior elite. Uh, and you know, we have these beautiful assemblages such as this one from Hungary, representing very typical uh, uh, weapons of the period, including swords that were first introduced during the Middle Bronze Age, not just the region, but basically in the world. And just also, I would like to uh, uh, raise your attention to these beautiful, fantastic decorations on these artifacts. And, you know, of course, with this elite, we would see also the first cuirasses or armors occurring. This particular artifact was found in the Danube River. So many times, actually, they were deposited, not just, for example, this particular assemblage, but this one also was deposited either in rivers or in the ground, and they were so-called hordes. And then, you know, again, we are continuing with the weapons, because with this warrior center society, or warrior center societies rather, we also would see these kind of like symbolic weapons that you cannot use. It's gold. They are gold halberds or, or gold daggers. They cannot be used, but they can be used during ceremonies, during rituals. You can show off. You have like these very important, uh, you have this very important metal, you have this shine, but of course, you know, you cannot use it. And then, you know, with, with, uh, with the gold, and this is the period where I was talking about roughly 2,000 years after Varna, when you would see also these gold hordes occurring in the archaeological record, including this collection of fantastic dress ornaments. Actually, we are really proud of this particular artifacts having for our show, because half of it is owned by the Hungarian National Museum. The other half is owned by the Hungarian, uh, of the National History Museum in Romania. Basically, it was found in 1847, and it was a Habsburg uh, 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 monarchy, and it was divided into two parts. One went to Bucharest, the other, the other part went to, to Budapest. And ever since, they have never been uh, displayed together. This is the first time that they are displayed actually together. Also, uh, I, would, I wanted to show you these seemingly pretty ugly artifacts, so like especially compared to the gold and compared to the beautiful bronze weapons. Well, they are an uh, important part of our story. They are actually uh, uh, the replicas or copies of uh, cycladic marble figurines in the Balkans. In uh, Albania, you also would find you know, uh, some similar assemblage in North Macedonia, their actually connection to the Cycladus was represented by these beautiful, to us at least, beautiful uh, uh, assemblages like this one from Stoi, uh, Albania. 
Well, you know, in this session, uh, we also have a pyre, and a kind of like a reconstruction of the pyre. It was such a great, uh, fantastic game to figure out how we can create a pretty uh, 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 vivid uh, 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 reproduction of a pyre. This is, you know, how it's going to look. Of course, you know, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Then we are entering into the last session of our uh, exhibition, and this is the Iron Age. Again, with a new metal, iron. Well, you know, this is also a period where you would find the representation of women uh, really frequently. Uh, you, would, you would have these rich collections of artifacts uh, buried with them, women. So we have had a lot of chance here to talk about the role of women in ancient societies, especially in the Iron Age. This one represents a collection associated with a, uh, an elite uh, member of the society, elite woman member of society. Then we have this beautiful amber uh, breast ornament uh, from Croatia. Uh, and it's, this, is, this is the amber. You cannot find amber in the Balkans. You've got to go to the Baltic region. We are talking about you, you travel more than 1,000 kilometers in order to get the amber. Of course, you use the trade networks. And trade networks were, were uh, uh, controlled by the elite uh, in the Carpathian Basin, in the Balkans, and of course the elite uh, took advantage of, you know, of these, these new materials in order to show off, in order to display wealth, in order to display status, in order to display prestige, and this is a very important artifact to talk about that perspective. And, you know, this uh, uh, Greek bronze vessel originally was manufactured in Sparta, but then it ended up on the Great Hungarian Plain, roughly 1,000 miles away. So with that, we can talk about politics. We can talk about diplomacy. On the Great Hungarian Plain, we have the Scythian tribes who were connected somehow to Sparta during the uh, 8th century or uh, to, to 6th century. So we can talk about this very important aspect, how uh, the elite could actually establish relationships due uh, through many different kind of activities, for example, warfare. Probably Scythian warriors were hired by, uh, for, for Greek uh, 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 military actions. Then, you know, uh, one more artifact that I want, wanted to show you. This is the famous ribbage urn, also uh, from the uh, Iron Age, with feasting scenes with feasting scenes, with some uh, mythical creatures, that would actually show us how during the Iron Age uh, ceremonies would occur, rituals would occur. It's a very important resource in order to talk about these uh, uh, social events. And we are entering into the last session of the exhibition. Uh, and this last session uh, focuses on the Thracians. And luckily, you know, uh, we have a lot to show. So I'm going to show you only like two, two uh, assemblages. This is the Borowo treasure. It's a feasting set with actually uh, motifs coming from different cultural spheres, coming from the Steppe region, coming from Persia, coming from Greece. The Thracian culture, uh, involved in, in, in uh, incorporated all these elements into their material culture. And this is a perfect, beautiful example of that. And we have this fantastic uh, helmet. Only three similar ones are known uh, currently uh, from the region. And with that, you would see uh, different elements, including, of course, these mythical elements that you also see in the Borovo treasure. And it's also talking about uh, the elite, also talking about uh, actually probably uh, formal kings. And of course, this is the last one with the Nikkei uh, application, uh, this wreath that might have been used by one of the, uh, the Thracian kings, uh, Cotis, uh, and were buried, was buried with that king. All right, so. Really quickly about the books, uh, uh, we are going to publish altogether three books. One has already came out, uh, uh, is, and it was, uh, I think it's pretty uh, amazing. In terms of contents, we have four sessions. Those sessions 
focused on different periods, now the Copper Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. Altogether, we had 10 essays, and we were fortunate to uh, convince to, uh, uh, Gary Feynman in order to write uh, an introduction part of this book. What is interesting about this book, we tried to, to work uh, with local people. Absolutely, it was absolute success, but we also we tried to pair them up. So, for example, we have a Hungarian who published a, a chapter with uh, a, a Serbian colleague. Then we have a Croatian colleague who published a, a chapter with a Bosnian colleague. So we try to somehow uh, make these connections between different uh, nations and between different archaeologists uh, strong, as strong as it possible. And uh, these are just some images from the book. Uh, the great photos by Adam Vago, mostly uh, what we mentioned, whom we mentioned before. We used archival uh, materials. We used beautiful maps created by also a Hungarian colleague. We tried to work with local people with the book uh, as, far, uh, as, as, long, uh, as much as we could. And then we have the second book that is going to be published soon. This is the catalog book. Uh, and in the catalog book, just some, some taste, we are going to have uh, really short introductory chapters for uh, each uh, session, the Neolithic, Copper Age, Iron, Bronze Age, and Iron Age session. And you know, we are going to have short descriptions written by local colleagues. All of them are local colleagues that Bill showed you before. We are really proud that we could actually bring together more than 50 local colleagues to work with us on these book projects. Thank you very much. Uh, and these are all our colleagues and supporting organizations.